Hi everyone, in this video on integrals and integration, we'll be learning about volumes of revolution. More specifically, we'll be learning about volumes of revolution about the x-axis. And to make sure that we really understand what we'll be covering here, we'll start by illustrating what a volume of revolution actually is, we'll then state the formula for calculating a volume of revolution, and we'll then explain how that formula is derived. Once that's done, we'll work through an example to show how that formula can be used. And of course, if you want to skip a section or another, I've added chapters to the video down below for you to move back and forth if needs be. All that being said, I'll get out of the way and let's get started. Let's say we have a portion of the curve y equals to x squared plus 1, which looks something like this, so that's y equals to x squared plus 1 and that this portion of the curve starts at an x value of 0 and ends at an x value of 3. And now I want you to imagine if we were to rotate this curve around the x-axis through 360 degrees. Or another way of saying that is that we're going to revolve this curve around the x-axis through 360 degrees. And I should really label these axes, that would be the x-axis, and of course that would be the y-axis. If we revolve this curve through 360 degrees around the x-axis, it would create a volume looking something like this. There we go. We can see that we have a shape which looks a bit like a trumpet. And in fact, for the sake of illustrating this, I'll even shade the outside surface, like so. Okay, now the volume we've just obtained by revolving the curve about the x-axis is known as a volume of revolution. And the question we're going to learn how to answer in this video is, what's its volume? Well, to calculate its volume, there's actually a nice little formula. And here it is. The volume, which I'll call capital V, obtained when revolving a curve through 360 degrees about the x-axis between two values of x, typically called a and b, is equal to the definite integral from a to b of pi y squared. And in fact, I'll go ahead and box that. Do make a note of this formula if you hadn't seen it before. And I should say you may also see this formula with f of x written instead of y here. And so this is the formula we'll use to calculate the volume we've just created here. But what I would really like is for you to understand why this is the formula. And so here's my attempt at explaining why this is the formula and how it works. Going back to the volume we have here, Consider the cross-section I'm drawing right now. As I'm sure you can tell, the cross-sectional area here is equal to the cross-sectional area of a disk. And that disk has a center which is pierced by the x-axis, and its radius r is equal to the height of the curve at the cross-section. In other words, the radius r here is given by y. So for instance, if ever we were two units along the x-axis here, then the value of y, and therefore the radius of this disk, would be 2 squared plus 1, which would be 5. And so I'll just say that the radius of this disk is equal to y. Furthermore, like all disks, its area is equal to pi r squared. And since r is equal to y, the area of this disk, and therefore of the cross-section here, is given by pi y squared. And in fact, I'll box that intermediate result. Okay, now that we've established that the cross-sectional area of this disk is pi y squared, let's add some thickness to it. In other words, let's add a third dimension and turn this into a cylinder. Here's what I mean. I'm gonna consider the same disk we have here, and therefore the same cross-section we started off with here on our volume. And I'll try and draw that looking something like this. There we go and I'll add a tiny bit of thickness to it, something looking like this. And so in an attempt to be clear, the top here is the cross-sectional area of the disk whose formula we just found, pi y squared. Now by adding this bit of thickness to our disk, we've actually created a cylinder, and its height is equal to the thickness we've just added, which I'll go ahead and call delta x. And I'm using this lowercase delta in front of the x, to highlight the fact that what we're actually doing here is considering a very thin slice through the volume we have here. In other words, the delta x we have here corresponds to the thickness of the slice I've cut on the volume. Okay, now back to our little cylinder down here, which remember has a radius equal to y, 
we can calculate its volume, which I'll go ahead and call delta V, using the fact that the volume of a cylinder is equal to the area of its base times its height. And since the area of the base is pi y squared, this cylinder's volume is equal to pi y squared times delta x. And in fact, I'll box that intermediate result as well. And so that's the volume of this very thin cylinder I have here, whose radius is equal to the height of the curve, so y, at the value of x at which I sliced through the volume. Now I'm sure you can appreciate that if I were to create similar cylinders all along the length of this volume, from x equals to 0 up to x equals to 3, then I could approximate this volume by adding the volumes of all those very thin cylinders together. In other words, the total volume of revolution v would be approximately equal to the sum of the volumes of all of the thin cylinders I'd obtain between x equals to 0 and x equals to 3. And so that would be the sum of all of the delta v's we'd get. But since delta v is equal to pi y squared times delta x, this would be equal to the sum of all of the pi y squared times delta x's. And in the limit, when we let delta x tend towards zero, in other words, when the height of this cylinder and all the other cylinders we could make becomes infinitely small, we replace this delta x by d of x. And we could even write when delta x tends towards zero, delta v, which remember equals to pi y squared times delta x, will tend towards dv, which will equal to pi y squared times dx. And now because we're dealing with the infinitely small and not just the very small, we can replace this summation symbol or sigma by the integral. And we can state that the volume created by revolving a curve about the x-axis through 360 degrees between x equals to a and x equals to b is equal to the definite integral from a to b of delta v, which in turn, using the result we have here, leads us to the volume equals to the definite integral from a to b of pi y squared dx. And that explains the formula. Okay, now that we have a better understanding of where this formula comes from, let's go ahead and actually use it to calculate the volume we started off with. Remember, this volume was created by revolving the curve y equals to x squared plus 1 through 360 degrees about the x-axis. And that was done between x equals to 0 and x equals to 3. So, to calculate its volume, I'll just write SOL as in solution. We can use this formula and state that the volume is equal to the integral from 0 to 3 of pi times y squared. But since y in this case would be x squared plus 1, this becomes pi times x squared plus 1 squared. And all I have to do now is evaluate this integral. Now what I like to do is take this factor of pi outside of the integral. In other words, I like to write that this equals to pi times the definite integral from 0 to 3 of x squared plus 1 squared. And now I open up this pair of parentheses, leading us to pi times the definite integral from 0 to 3 of x to the power of 4 plus 2x squared plus 1. And now integrating each of these three terms, this turns into pi times in square brackets x to the power of 5 over 5 plus 2 thirds of x cubed plus x, with lower limit 0 and upper limit 3. That becomes pi times the expression we obtain by replacing every x we have here by the upper limit, minus the expression we obtain by replacing every x by the lower limit. So let's see, replacing every x we have by 3, the upper limit, that would be 3 to the power of 5 over 5, plus 2 thirds times 3 cubed, plus 3. And I take away from that what we'd get by replacing every x we have here by 0. And after a quick glance, we quickly realize that if we replace every x we have here by 0, this entire expression will equal to 0. And so we can just write minus 0. Now, carrying on up here, this equals to pi times 3 to the power of 5, which is 243, and that's over 5, plus 
2 thirds times 3 cubed, which is 2 thirds of 27, which is 18, plus 3. I carry on, that's equal to pi times 243 over 5 plus 21, and that's equal to pi times 243 over 5 plus 105 over 5. Finally, adding these two fractions together, we can state that the volume is equal to 243 plus 105, which is 348, so that's 348 fifths of pi. And that's 348 fifths of pi units of volume. And the result I just boxed here would be the exact value. But if you have access to a calculator, then when you enter this, you should find, when rounding to three significant figures, that the volume is equal to 219 units of volume. And that's the answer. There we go everyone, I really hope that helped, and if it did, please hit like on this video, drop a comment down below, and even subscribe to this channel, because that really will help this video reach as many students as possible. All that being said and done, that's it for this tutorial.